So this is the spinal column and the pelvis. And as I said, the pelvis is, consists of three bones, the two ilium on the side, this is the hip socket, and at the, in the back of it is the sacrum. And the sacrum ends in this thing called the coccyx. The two ilium attach in the front with a cartilage called the pubic symphysis. And then so these are the five lumbar vertebrae, L5, L4, 3, 2, 1, and then followed by the 12 thoracic vertebrae and then the seven cervical vertebrae. These yellow things are the nerves exiting between each vertebrae and this red thing is an artery. And you can see that the cervical vertebrae are a lot smaller. These things between are the disc. And as we coming back down towards the low back area, the disc are much larger and the vertebrae itself um, is much bigger for support. The yellow thing all the way up is the spinal cord. This is the occipital area. This is the base of the head. And this is the cervical vertebrae. So when I say put your hands in your occiput is this area. So next, let's look at the pelvis and the spine facing up. And let's talk about what I mean when I talk about spinal articulations. This is the ASIS, the two bony protrusions in the front, where I usually say that place your hands on your ASIS. And these guys are your sit bones. So when I say sit on your sit bones, this is what I'm asking you to, to do. Sit on your butt and sit on these two guys. So the pelvic tilt, what is happening in the pelvic tilt and what is spinal articulation? The pelvic tilt is when you are there should be some space under naturally. This guy is not very flexible, not very mobile. And there should be less of a curve in the neck area. But so there's some space under the low back. And when you're coming into a posterior tilt, when you are squishing that blueberry, you're bringing your pubic bone closer, closer to your nose. And then this is what starts happening that you're touching down each spinous process. These things on each spine, each vertebrae, called the spinous process. So as you're curling up, these guys are touching down and there's movement happening between the vertebrae. These are the facet joints between each vertebrae. So a neutral tilt coming into a posterior tilt this is what squishing the blueberry means. And as you're coming up into a bridge, you're touching down each spinous processes. And when you're coming back down, you're just landing each bone, each vertebrae down. And when I say that the L5, the last lumbar vertebrae, and the first, the SI joint, your sacrum, we call it S1, L5, S1 junction, is usually not mobile on anyone, usually very stiff. So this is an, a hard area to mobilize out. And then we're coming into an anterior tilt, which is when we are bringing the pelvis forward, creating a larger space under the low back. So this is what the mouse house is. This is what squishing the blueberry is and this is what the mouse house refers to. And next let's look at the foot. This is the tibia and fibula. This is the heel bone and this is the talus. So when I say press your heel down, press the ball of the foot down and press your toes down, well this guy is not flexible. He doesn't do Pilates. But so when you're pressing your foot down and then you're raising up into a bridge, that's what's happening. Or when you're pointing and flexing your ankle, you mobilizing your tibia and fibula over the talus. 
and so creating mobility in your ankle which is also important and lastly we have this guy he was in a car accident but we don't have the heart to throw him out so this is the suboccipital area these are your suboccipital muscles when i say flex your head forward or extend your head back this is these guys are the muscles that we are mobilizing the seven cervical vertebrae the 12 thoracic vertebrae and between each vertebrae these guys it's all the way down it's just all of them are missing already these guys called the deep spinal stabilizers your multifidi and rotator muscles so when you're articulating the spine these guys are the one these muscles are the one that's shortening and lengthening as you bringing each bone down to the mat the five lumbar vertebrae and then the sacrum these blue things are the ligaments in the sacrum there's a lot of ligaments to hold this pelvis together your this is the piriformis i'm going to bring it like this the piriformis and this is the sciatic nerve these are the external rotators the obturator and gemelli muscles this is the glute medius under on top of it glute minimus the deepest glute medius and glute max on top for the shoulder this is the teres infraspinatus supraspinatus comes under the acromion and in the front is the subscapularis these four guys are the rotator cuff muscles and these two no wonder this guy is broken these two things are the shoulder blades the scapula and what's interesting that they can not on this one but they can come closer when i say close the elevator doors that means that bringing these two bones together and then i ask you to open the elevator doors is that you're bringing these two bones away from each other this is the apex of the scapula and usually people have a hard time bringing these two guys together also interesting that these two bones the shoulder blades is actually floating over the ribs the only attachment point is in the front this is the sternum or chest bone or breast bone so the shoulder blades attach to the front with the clavicle and this is the only attachment point the ribs the true ribs and the false ribs the floating ribs are these two guys down otherwise the ribs attach with cartilage to the sternum or breast bone and same thing a lot of people have very limited range of motion very limited mobility in their chest or thoracic area so when we are curling up when we are coming into a capital flexion or curling forward or flexion this is what's happening this guy actually has better um, natural curves than the other one so what's happening here is that coming into flexion we raising each bone up and a lot of people can't in the thoracic very limited so then can't raise vertebrae by vertebrae they usually just come up in one piece and they usually use their rectus abdominis which is in the front to like come up all the way and they have also a very hard time articulating the spine touching down each vertebrae as they come down and lastly, this guy is actually interesting. So these are the discs between each vertebrae. And this guy has arthritis. 
the disk space between L4 and L5 is damaged. And this guy also has, besides having a severe spine, he also has a um, herniated disc. This is what herniated disc is when the disc is bulging out, coming out, and it's pressing on the nerve. These guys are the nerves. They come out between, from the spinal cord is under, and they come out here between each vertebrae. And when the, ner when the disc <clears throat> is pressing on the nerve, that's what bulging or herniated disc is. And again, this is in the back, the sciatic nerve. So when someone has herniated disc, depends what segment is herniated, they have pain down, usually on that side, but it can be the other side as well. And then we know what segment is herniated based on where they have symptoms, whether it's the front of the leg, the back of the leg, goes down only to the knees, goes down all the way to the ankle or foot. So that's how we know which segment is um, herniated. And then now let's look at the hip joint. So this is the hip socket with, this is the femur or thigh bone, this is the ilium, and the hip is referred to as a perfect marriage because the ball, this is a ball and socket joint. So the ball of the thigh bone, the femur, fits perfectly into the hip socket. And it allows for good range of motion, but also pretty good stability. Versus the shoulder, which is a not very stable marriage, because the shoulder, this is the humerus or upper arm bone. It's referred to as a golf ball. This guy is a golf ball sitting on a tee. So it has a lot more, a lot wider range of motion than the hip. However, it's not very stable. So it needs the ligaments to keep it preventing from dislocation. And again, this is the subscapularis, the teres, infraspinatus, and this guy on top is the supraspinatus, the four rotator cuff muscles that allow the shoulder to move and the ligaments and these muscles keep it in place because it's unstable compared to the perfect marriage of the ball and socket of the hip. This guy is very broken. It should be attached here with this cartilage. And then lastly, this is the hip flexor. This is the ilium. And this is another hip flexor. This is the psoas. So you can see this is a narrow muscle attached to this guy called the lesser tubercle. And your psoas attaches in the front and crosses over to the back and attached to the lumbar vertebrae in the back. So it's an interesting muscle. It's an S-shaped muscle. It's a, it's a strong muscle. It's a strong hip flexor. Skinny guy is the QL or quadratus lumborum. So if you're looking at from the side, it's a very, it's a, it's a very thin, it's like a pancake muscle, but it's wide. So let's just look at it from poor guy, the back. There. Attached from the top of the ilium, it should be to the 12 rib. And again, it's a wide muscle, but it's very thin. And it allows for side bending, back bending, and forward bending. But so let's just finish up because this is a lot more than I wanted to go into. But I hope this was useful. If you guys have any questions, 
just please leave it in the comments. Thank you.